Good morning, family. On behalf of Pastor Justin and Melanie Naidu, I would like to welcome you to the Life Community Church online broadcast. Today, Pastor Justin will be speaking about a topic many of us have heard of and may have experienced in the past, which is racism. In a short while, we will begin praise and worship. But for now, please enjoy the Bible adventure. You look different today. That's because I'm a detective. I'm looking for God. But I can't see God anywhere. <laughs> you won't find God with a magnifying glass. He's way too big to see with your eyes. Then how am I going to get to know him? One way is to learn about him by reading your Bible every day. Oh, yeah! Let me try. Aw, oh, Mr. Stone, I can't read yet. You can ask a grown-up or an older kid to read it to you. I'll read the Bible to you any time, Blinky. Gee, thanks, Mr. Stone. Are there any other ways to get to know God? Why, yes, Blinky. You can spend time singing to God to show you love him. Wow! I super to you for love singing to God. So do I. But those aren't the only ways to get to know God. What? What else can I do? You can talk to God and listen to him. I know about that. Friends, what's it called when you talk to God? <laughs> Thank you, friends. It is called praying. Since praying to God helps me get to know Him, I'm going to pray right now. Dear God, thanks for giving us special ways to get to know you. In Jesus' name, Amen! amen. I 
God of wonders, God of wonders beyond our galaxy. You are holy, holy. The universe declares your majesty. You are God of wonders beyond our galaxy, you are holy, holy, the universe declares your majesty.
Lord, I give you my heart. I give you my soul. I live for you alone. Every breath that I take, every moment I'm aware. Well, warm greetings, family and friends, on this Sunday morning. We've been in the book of Genesis now for several weeks of, as we have been laying foundations. And we're speaking particularly about the foundation of righteousness. In Psalm 89, David says, The foundation of the throne is righteousness and justice. In Genesis chapter 18, we find that there's a man by the name of Abraham and God is not going to hide what he's doing from Abraham. Abraham was accredited with righteousness and he was one who was able to do righteousness and justice. But God was about to destroy the city of Sodom and God is not going to hide what he's doing and Abraham begins to plead with God. He enters into almost negotiating with God. He says, if we can find 50 righteous Will you spare the city? 45 righteous. The number comes down to 40. And then Abraham says, If we find a company of 30 righteous people, in Genesis 18 and verse number 30, will you spare the city? Now the number 30 speaks of maturity. And last week we dealt extensively with how a company of people must emerge on the earth who can come to the measure and the stature of the Lord Jesus Christ. Remember, Christ is the model. He is the template. At the age of 30, Jesus entered into public ministry. He comes to John at the river Jordan. And this is critical because maturity is seen in the manner in which we submit ourselves to others. 
Last week we dealt with Joseph, who at the age of 30 was the prime minister of Egypt. And when you come to maturity like Joseph, you see the, the, the accusations of others from a completely different light. Joseph would say to his brothers, you sold me, but God sent me. And that is very critical for us at this particular hour in, in, in seeing through the lens of the Father, seeing the divine architectural design for our lives. In 2 Samuel chapter 6, David, in bringing back the ark, had to choose 30,000 choice men. So in bringing back the ark, there had to be a company of mature people that could value the ark. But for our journey and discourse this morning, I want to deal with a very important aspect. One that has gripped us. One that has been spoken much about in the last month in our nation. Ephesians 4.13 says, Till we all come to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God, to a perfect man, the NIV would say to a mature man, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. We want to come to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. And this, this topic that has been spoken about so much in the last month is racism. Now mature people, mature people in Christ, a mature company in the faith, have come to the place where we no longer have a jaundiced, prejudiced view of others. In fact, you come to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. Christ is not prejudiced. Christ, in fact, his spirit rises above all forms of bigotry. The Lord Jesus is not sexist. He is not racist. His spirit rises above all bias and partiality. And I'm calling for us today to look within, to conduct a forensic audit of our thoughts, our attitudes, uh, the way we view others. Racism is the notion that one's ethnic stock or skin color is superior to another. In the 20th century, we saw narcissism. You would read about the Ku Klux Klan. You would, in South Africa, have experienced apartheid up until 1994. All these belief systems spring from a haughty attitude of racial superiority. Now, in the recent weeks here in South Africa, there have been allegations of racism in several communities across the country. And unfortunately, racism does not begin or end with social or political groups. Racism has contaminated the church, the body of Christ. And there are many Christians, many believers who claim to be anointed, who claim to have much knowledge about the scriptures and about the kingdom of God. They can even quote the scriptures. Yet, we remain biased and opinionated when it comes to race. I know some of you might, might not take too kindly to some of the words that I have to begin to speak to you, but I have a word that I feel very strongly in my spirit and needs to be spoken to, not just to our local church, but to the entire body of Christ. And I'm sure the apostles in the faith will address some of these deep-rooted problems. You see, people use racist terms, racist slurs. They crack jokes and speak ill against other race groups. This is not innocent. And God will hold us accountable for the words that we speak. Now, if we don't overcome racism in the church, we will never sit and never reign with the king of kings in his throne. Because his throne is a throne of righteousness and justice. This is the foundation. Now, in Acts 17 and verse 20, the, or 26, the Bible says, God has made one blood of all nations. One blood of all nations. Now, racism, racism is firstly hereditary. You see, when racism is passed from parent to child, it comes from 
one generation to the next. And this usually happens in the first five years of a child's life. The lie of racism is inherited. Parents are actively teaching their children about racism, mostly by example, and sometimes it's even done under the disguise of religion. It could even be in terms of religious training. Unfortunately, in the last 50 years of our history, this kind of racism has often been fostered by the church. And God is not pleased with white churches, with Indian churches, or black churches, or even multiracial churches. You see, when you read the scriptures very closely, he has made one blood. You will read about one new man in Christ Jesus. So you have racism that is hereditary. Secondly, you have racism that comes from the environment, environmental racism. Now, we cannot lie about this. We are all products of our environment. You are crafted by your environment. And environmental racism consists of racial attitudes, beliefs, and the erroneous concept of racial superiority that's caused by the overpowering influence of your environment and your associations. And thirdly, we have reactionary or reverse racism. We've seen this in the last few days where this form of racism is triggered by a suppressed group by the ill treatment of acts of racism that are inflicted by others. And I want to say to us today, God hates racism in all forms. Racism is a sin. It is rooted in degeneracy. It is rooted in wickedness, in pride, in superior attitudes, in ignorance, and in fear. Now you see the unregenerated Adamic flesh, the unregenerated man is the soil from which these racist attitudes spring forth. Now the central theme of racism is pride. Now I know I might sound like I am a little poetic, but to help us remember, uh, I thought we'd put it in, in a few um, easy words. The first pride is the pride of place, the pride of place. And this is social status. This is being seen in a better social light, the pride of place. The second pride is the pride of face. This is physical attributes. Then there is the pride of grace, where you have religious traditions, religious, you're proud of your network or denomination. Then there is the pride of race. This is based on skin color or ethnicity. You have to ask yourself, why do people exaggerate their own importance? Well, people of all race groups will want to exaggerate their own importance to overshadow the value of others who are different. This happens primarily for those of us in the church. It happens when we have failed to study God's word, when we fail to gain enlightenment from the scriptures, and this results in, in the propagation of absurd concepts and the doctrine of demons. People generally fear what they do not know. We are afraid to be joined with other people from other races, we are at times apprehensive of what it might produce in other areas of our lives. And many people simply fear change. Now, the old Sunday school song that we sung, red and yellow, black and white, they are precious in his sight. And Dr. Luke in Acts 17 is saying to us, God has made one blood of all nations. All nations uh, is, or the word nations is the word ethnos. God is saying to us, all ethnos, all nations came from one blood. Now, this is very interesting because all races then have one beginning. This means, very simply, friends, that the billions of people on the earth right now all have 
one source of blood. This is Adam and Eve. And the blood was preserved through Noah and his family, even through the flood. Yet, if we go back historically, very recently, in the last um, 80 years, you could say, in World War II, did you know that a white soldier could not receive a blood transfusion from an Asian or a black soldier because of fear and ignorance? Now, medical science and, and many pathologists will tell you that apart from blood types, all blood is the same. It doesn't matter, friends, what color you are, what generation you were born in, what language you speak. We all came from one blood. Mankind has one father who created us all in his image and in his likeness. So when you go to the book of Genesis, to the book of beginnings, Genesis 2, 7, the Lord formed man of the dust of the ground. So he made man from dust. Now, when you look at dust, it, you look at sand. It is made up of a variety of colors, brown, black, dusky, red, or even sandy. So this Adam was probably reddish brown, as his name suggests. Now, for us, who are living in this 21st century, we have to understand that our skin color, our, ethnic our ethnicity, was a definite act of God, not some blind chance or mistake. You see, God chose the color that you are. It was not a mistake. He gave you the features. If you read Psalm 139 verse 14, it says, David writes, it says, I will praise thee, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Marvelous are your works. We as the sons of God are made in his image and likeness. And I want to say to us, never allow someone's irrational, ignorant, racist remarks to make you feel inferior, insulted, or even ugly. You and I are beautiful in his sight. So the opinions and the words of others don't really matter. Now, when you come to maturity, and this is the righteous company that must emerge on the earth. And when the righteous company emerges on the earth that display maturity, then according to Genesis chapter 18, judgments are aborted upon cities and upon nations. But we have to start with the mind. Because racism is a stronghold that is set up in the mind. And there are mindsets of inferiority that are created by generations of discrimination. And these are very, very difficult to change. And as the new Jerusalem, we must learn to accept the ethnicity of others without partiality, without prejudice, and without bias. In Acts chapter 10 and verse 34, God, Peter says that God is no respecter of persons. God is no respecter of persons. Now the Greek word that is translated as respecter is the word prosopolemtes. It means to show no favoritism or to show favoritism. So when God is no respecter, he shows no favoritism. Now, this is a very important part of practical righteousness remember the foundation we are laying is righteousness because part of practical righteousness is the dynamic of equity equity is the quality of being fair and impartial it is being just it is being right the bible says in psalm 98 the lord shall judge the people with equity so when you are displaying practical righteousness, part of it is a, being a person who displays equity. In 2 Chronicles 19, uh, verse number 6 says, Take heed to what you are doing, for you do not judge for man, but for the Lord who is with you in the judgment. Now therefore, let the fear of the Lord be upon you. Take care and do it, for there is no inequity 
with the Lord our God. In fact, it would read, there is no partiality with the Lord our God. Proverbs 28, 21 says, to have respect of persons is not good. That means to show partiality, to have prejudice. If you read John chapter 7 and verse 24, it says, judge not according to the appearance. Judge not according to the skin color, to the ethnicity. But judge righteously. Now, it is the view of certain people um, that people experience physiological changes directly related to the area they live in, to the geographical location, through some of the dietary and environmental peculiarities. Now, let's look at the book of Song of Solomon, or Song of Songs. I love uh, this book. It's a very romantic book. But the Shulamite, she says this. She says to the daughters of Jerusalem, Dark am I, yet lovely, you daughters of Jerusalem. Verse 6, chapter 1, verse 6. Do not stare at me because I am dark, because I am darkened by the sun. You see, the true skin cannot be seen by the natural eye. I don't know how many of you have visited a dermatologist, but there are several layers, and I hope we can view it this morning. What we see is the covering that protects your true skin. The true skin has nerve endings, and it has minute blood vessels that otherwise would be damaged by the sun. The true skin is basically the same in people everywhere. The outer layer, the outer layer that contains the pigment is the epidermis. It has five layers for the primary purpose of protection. Now as its surface is being worn away, new cells are supplied. Now although there is no pigment, the reproducing chemical in the true skin or the dermis is called melanin, which is stored in the epidermis. You will even see this in the hair. Melanin is released in the epidermis in amounts that are necessary to shield the skin from the sun. This then produces a richer color to the skin so that the ultraviolet rays cannot penetrate. Basically, what I'm saying is the body tans itself. Color is not race. Color has nothing to do with the image of God. Now, many historians uh, that wrote many wonderful books, including Josephus, will tell us that the Garden of Eden was actually located within Africa. Josephus supported the view that the Gion River in the garden was connected to the Nile River. Others have the view that Ethiopia, which means black, was part of the garden. And these scholars are of the opinion that Noah and his wife had to have been a person of color to beget or to produce children of color. Now I'm looking through the scriptures and I want us to see this very clearly. Moses was raised by Pharaoh's daughter who was a black princess. When Moses would go into the wilderness for 40 years, Jethro a priest of Midian who imparted such great wisdom to Moses was a dark-skinned man. This is just in, in the Pentateuch, in the, in the first five books of the Bible. Hagar, who was given to Abraham by Sarah to produce a son, was an Egyptian woman. As you look further through the scriptures, you would find that Solomon encountered the queen of Sheba. The queen of Sheba was an African woman. In fact, she was a prominent international trader who would deal with gold and other commodities. Even the, the man who penned uh, the, the, the book of Zephaniah, the prophet who some would call a minor prophet, Zephaniah was said to be a, a man of color. He was the son of Cushi. Cushi means black. Abraham had a dark-skinned wife named Keturah. I think we must read the scriptures very carefully. There are many things, friends, 
that need to be looked at through the lens of God's word. Doctrine determines our practice and there must be an unlearning, a deconstructing, a repenting, a pulverizing, a breaking down of racist attitudes and approaches. When you look at Isaiah chapter 1 and verse 18, the prophet writes and says, Though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. Though they be red as crimson, they shall be as wool. Look at this verse very carefully. Your sin is as scarlet, though they be red like crimson. What is Isaiah saying to us? God does not see skin. God sees sin. He sees the color of sin. Throughout the Bible, friends, throughout the Bible, dark-skinned people have been used by God to be a blessing. Even in the New Testament, Simon of Cyrene, who helped the Lord Jesus to carry the cross when his physical body grew weak, was an Ethiopian man. In the book of Acts, in Acts chapter 8, God had interrupted the citywide revival that was conducted by evangelist Philip. And this took place, this interruption took place so that one black man could be ministered to. This was the Ethiopian eunuch. And this man, the Ethiopian eunuch, was the treasurer. Uh, he was the secretary of the treasury. And he later, the Ethiopian eunuch, later on, would share the gospel of Christ with the queen called Candace. My beloved friends, God has been using people of color, men and women, to share his word. Throughout the scriptures, God showed no partiality. God was not prejudiced or biased. In the, new, in the, in the last hundred years of church history, People like Charles Mason and William Seymour were used in the Azusa Street Revival to birth the Pentecostal movement. William Seymour would start the Azusa Street Church. It was called the Apostolic Faith Mission, the AFM. Then from there, the uh, Assemblies of God was birthed. The Church of God, the full gospel Church of God was birthed through these men, Charles Mason and William Seymour, who were black American men. Frederick Price, recently. Crefro Dollar, T.D. Jakes, the late Miles Monroe, Bishop Eddie Long, Tudor Bismarck, are all African men, men of color. What is God showing us? In recent years, even South Africa, we have seen great apostles arise out of our communities Men of God who have been able to impact and influence the globe. God is showing us that he is no respecter of persons. What needs to happen in the body of Christ is that we need to come to a mature man. This 30 company must arise to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. And Christ is not prejudiced. Race hierarchies must fall in the house of God. And we applaud politicians and community activists for playing their role in trying to deconstruct racist attitudes and approaches. But it is my conviction that judgment must begin in the house of God. It must start with the sons of God. And if we say in our country more than 70% of our country are Christians those who bear the name of Christ, then we have to see a change in the house of God. We must come up higher because his ways are higher. His thoughts are higher. God is not looking for a multiracial church. God is looking for a church that lives and, and moves in oneness. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one. He's not just united because we can gather to be politically correct on a Sunday morning and say we have people of different ethnicities coming together, but we leave divided. God is looking for us to come back to the principle of oneness. We must abolish these racist attitudes, these policies and practices that is in the church of Jesus Christ. This enemy 
this awful foe called racism was birthed and raised to maturity in the house of God. And today this evil still lurks amongst us. And I might add, it is even in us. Racism must be exposed. And it must be subdued and brought under the subjection of Christ and his church. Now it's not something new, friends. Racism is not something new. When we look into the word of God, we find several situations where the hearts of people were exposed. The Old Testament in Numbers chapter 12, and I'm going to read it this morning. Numbers chapter 12, follow with me this, this very interesting narrative. The Bible says, Then Miriam and Aaron, the brother and sister of Moses, spoke against Moses because of the Ethiopian woman he had married. Aaron was the high priest. He was anointed with several measures of the anointing. The Bible says, for Moses had married a black woman. So they said, has the Lord indeed spoken only through Moses? Has he not spoken through us also? And the Lord heard it. Now the man Moses was very humble, more than all the men who were on the face of the earth. Suddenly, watch God's response to racist attitudes and practices. Suddenly the Lord said to Moses, Aaron and Miriam, come out. You three to the tabernacle of meeting. So the three came out. Then the Lord came down in the pillar of cloud and stood in the door of the tabernacle and called out Aaron and Miriam. And this is what needs to happen today. We need to call out those who have racist attitudes and approaches. And they both went forward. Then God said, hear now my words. If there is a prophet among you, I, the Lord, make myself known to him in a vision. I speak to him in a dream. Not so with my servant Moses. He is faithful in all my house. I speak to him face to face, even plainly, not in dark sayings. And he sees, he sees the form of the Lord. Why then were you not afraid to speak against my servant Moses? Why were you not afraid to speak evil about Moses? And watch what happens. So the anger of the Lord was aroused against them. The anger of the Lord was aroused against what they had done. In that they had, they had viewed this marriage between Moses and the Ethiopian woman as something that was evil. And God departed. And watch what happens after he departs. And when the cloud departed from above the tabernacle, suddenly... Miriam became leprous, as white as snow. Now leprosy is a disease that affects the skin. And uh, you would find there sores on your body. We haven't seen it in South Africa, but I had the opportunity of going to a leper colony in India, where lepers are left in, in their own little fortified environment. And they are not allowed to be in, in the rest of the community. And you would see these sores on their bodies. And this is what took place. Miriam became leprous. And the very thing that she had a problem with, skin, skin color. Her own skin is now affected. God was sending out a very clear message. That I am not one who is prejudiced. And bias, I am angry with you, Miriam. I am angry with you, Aaron, for viewing things through the lens of man. Miriam and Aaron displayed racist behavior. In fact, Aaron became very afraid. And um, Aaron turned toward Miriam and saw that she was a leper. So he said to Moses, oh my Lord. Please do not lay this sin on us. What was the sin? The sin was racism in which we have done foolishly and in which we have sinned. And you can read on in verse 13. How Moses then, as a humble servant of the Lord, begins to plead with God on behalf of Miriam. Let me tell you what took place. Because Miriam, you can read the narrative. Because Miriam had leprosy, God's people 
were forbidden from moving. So for seven days, she had to be left out of the camp, the period for cleansing, and no movement took place with the entire nation. This is what racism has done to South Africa. We will not move into the promised land. We will not move toward the promises of God if we continue to live with racist attitudes and practices. We will be slowed down. This is what took place. They were slowed down. They had no movement. Even you personally, as a son of God, if you continue to practice and have these attitudes, you will not move into the promises of God. Aaron, as a high priest, would have been anointed with great measures of oil. You see, you can be extremely anointed, but still have and hold on to racial attitudes. And even as church leaders, we must ensure that we are at the forefront of bringing together the body of Christ into oneness, bringing the nation into oneness. Mir Miriam and Aaron, the problem here is they felt they were superior to the Ethiopian. Miriam's speech betrayed her. Miriam's speech betrayed her. Has the Lord indeed only spoken through Moses? Has he not spoken through us also? You see, your speech will always betray you. You can hide it for years and years. We've seen many people on Twitter uh, begin to tweet some racist remarks and comments, even on Facebook. Even when you are in a, in a tough situation, like when someone cuts in front of you on the road, then you begin to pull down your window and then you will begin to spew out these racist slurs. God called them out. And I'm saying to us today, we need to call out all the races in our church, in our homes, in our families. The anger of the Lord was aroused. God had no problem with Moses marrying the Ethiopian. God had a problem with the response of Aaron and Miriam. Even when you come into the New Testament, the same thing happened. In Galatians chapter 2, Paul has to call out Peter. Peter, in terms of seniority, would have been senior counsel to Paul. Peter was one who walked with the Lord Jesus. And sometimes in certain seasons of our lives, we can walk with the Lord. He would have seen the Lord Jesus sitting with the Samaritans. He would have seen him going to people of different ethnicities. Peter would have seen it. But in Galatians 2, when Peter came to Antioch, I had to oppose him face to face. This is what Paul is saying. For what he did was very wrong. When he first arrived, he ate with the Gentile believers who were not circumcised. But afterward, when some friends of James came, when the Jews came in, Peter wouldn't eat with the Gentiles anymore because he was afraid of criticism from these people who insisted on the necessity of circumcision. As a result, other Jewish believers followed Peter's hypocrisy. Even Barnabas was led astray by their hypocrisy. Paul was not afraid to call Peter out, to correct him, to align him. And I say to us today, that this has to begin in the house of God, where we are able to call people out, rebuke them in the spirit of love. Speak the truth in love. Because we don't want to have the brakes pulled on the momentum we have gained in the last 30 years as the church. We don't want like Moses and the rest of God's people to be, to be on pause whilst Miriam is cast out of the camp. Today, friends... Have you examined yourself? This is what I'm asking myself to do. We have to examine ourselves for the cancerous growth of this prejudice. You don't realize how prejudiced you are until you spend time with people of other race groups. I'll share some of my thoughts this morning. Let me indulge myself. 15 years ago, I had the opportunity of being sent to Pioneer and Planted Church 
in a predominantly black community. Now, because of South Africa's Group Areas Act that took place under apartheid, most of us lived amongst people of our own race group. So growing up, I had very little to no contact with people from the black community or people even from the white community. It is only when I had completed school and had to go to university that I had to sit next to some of our black and white brothers. And that too wasn't too much of interaction because we went back to our communities. And we went back to our churches as well because our churches were filled with people of our, of our own ethnicity. But when I, would ha when I had the opportunity to go into this community and work with people from another ethnicity, another race group, the Lord had to break me because I had been filled with so much of prejudices. There were lies. The, the environment that we grew up in crafted us, crafted our thinking, crafted our mindsets. You see, racist attitudes very seldom come out as long as you stay and live with people of your own kind. And God had to break me. So I would, in pioneering the church, we had to do door-to-door -door evangelism, and go and sit with families, break bread with them in their homes. And these were very simple people. Some of them were very poor people. I had to at times learn the language, begin to speak to them and share the gospel with them. And then they would invite us as we began to grow and, and come together. We began to be a part of the same family, the same household. And we would eat together, share a meal, eat off the same table. And the love of Christ was imparted so richly. And you would see some of the pictures. Some of these children became our children stayed with us, lived with us in our own home. We paid for their school fees. Today, one of them being a, a young lady by the name of Londi Magwaza, a highly qualified young lady who is now working in the United States of America. You see, racial, prejudice, racial prejudices quickly surface when you get into close quarters with people of other race groups. So today, how do we deal with this great sin? That's what I want to call it. This great sin or prejudice of racism. Firstly, friends, number one, see and treat racism as the sin it is or for the sin it is. In Acts 10 and verse 34, Peter began to speak and he says, I now realize how true it is that God does not show favoritism. In fact, some version of the Bible may say, God is no respecter of persons. Verse 35 says, But he accepts from every nation the one who fears him and does what is right. Secondly, and very key to us, very critical for us, repent and renounce all racist attitudes and practices so we can help free others. In 2 Corinthians chapter 10 and verse 4, it says, For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but they are mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. These things have been set up. During apartheid, there were separate uh, restrooms set up for people of different ethnicities. In certain homes and cultures, there were different sets of cutlery and crockery used for people of different ethnicities. These things have become practices that are hereditary, that are passed down to our children. So you've got to cast down imaginations. This is what Paul is saying. And every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God and bring into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. Thirdly, see people as God sees them. And refuse to know any man after the flesh. 2 Corinthians 5 says, Therefore from now on we regard no one according to the flesh, according to their skin color or their ethnicity. If you are an employer, I want to speak to you today, and this is very prophetic to us because in times past, people were remunerated based on the color of their skin. Employers 
should treat people with fairness and equity. This is a dimension of righteousness based on their competency and not their skin color. The Bible says the laborer is worthy of his wages. And I think this is very key for us if we want to uh, build in South Africa. Fifthly, we must fellowship with sons of God from different communities and different race groups. This will mean becoming uncomfortable for us in our household. I'm going to ensure that we go into, into other neighborhoods. We go into other communities. Number six, support, contribute, and be a part of seminars and symposiums on racism. I want to encourage that we have dialogues with our children around the table on these topics. In fact, Isaiah 1.18 says, Come, let us reason together. Show me if you feel that you are superior because of your skin color. Let's find out. Let's reason together from the scriptures. Because there is neither Jew nor Gentile. We can't go back to that. Because in Christ, we are one new man. There is neither Jew nor Gentile. If you have racist attitudes, you are neutralizing the finished work of the cross. You are making it of no effect. So support, contribute to these seminars. Then you should not support people, organizations, and even churches that practice racism. 2 Corinthians 6, 17, Paul says, Come out from among them, those who are racist, and be separate. Very importantly, I want to encourage us at this very, very critical time in South Africa. Intercede for all our leaders, our political leaders, our spiritual leaders, to bring about harmony in our nation and in the body of Christ. In recent days and in recent weeks, we have seen many people suffer hurt. And I'm asking for us, if we're going to deal with this prejudice, we're going to deal with this sin of racism, then we must forgive everyone who has hurt you through their racist acts, practices, and words. Matthew, Jesus says to us in the Lord's Prayer, let us forgive those who have trespassed against us. They have trespassed. They have violated your place, your person. And lastly, destroy race hierarchies. This must be destroyed in the church. Submit to the leadership that God has placed over you. We are partakers of grace, not race. In Galatians 3 and verse 28, the Bible says, There is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither slave nor free. There is neither male nor female. For you are all one in Christ. You are all one in Christ.